Well, Trent, I've got a couple of things I can share real fast. If you, yeah, uh, still I do have the, here. I have the PDF. So whenever we're ready, um, where we, where are we at? Like seven, seven, eighteen, seven, eighteen. Yeah. Okay. So whenever you're, you want to share your stuff first. Yeah. Do you want to turn it on so I can? Oh, yep. Sorry. And good. Okay. So I had this shared with me. And I thought this was kind of a cool, this was a survey that was done. I thought it was kind of a fun one. Um, so this is the narrative pulled off the survey. Um, the survey was done at the request of Leighton City uh, following a robbery of take one video to determine which city the cash register was in. Oh my gosh. So he's got his, his certificate there and this this is it. And so this is actually the building here. So you can see back here, there's some closets or back storerooms and then doors and windows that are laid out. And this is the city line through the building. Funny. So that's just a very unique survey. I thought I'd share it here. One of the um, counties, the county recorder mapper ladies shared that. And I thought it was a really kind of a fun one. Where's the register though? Where's the cash register? You know, this is all she shared with me. I've got to pull <laughs> up the original survey and see where the where the register actually was. Um, yeah. And then I have this, uh, this is newer. So I've blacked a lot out because it's probably findable. Yeah. Um, this is a narrative on a basis of bearings note. So it was an alpha survey and the last, couple of sentences there. The basis of bearing is the line between the calculated intersection of two streets and a witness corner to a section corner. And I'm being asked to retrace the survey. Boy. I've seen that quite a few times where, where they've even, well, they have one found monument and then the basis of bearing goes to a calculated point. I'm like, how the heck can you do that? Yep. And they don't even talk about how they calculate. Like, even yeah. if you walk through, I best fit the curb lines and found a center line yeah. and yeah. extended it. Like I could have maybe recreate it to some degree of, of accuracy, but uh, yeah, two interesting ones there to share with you guys tonight. So I didn't see James. Did James jump on? We missed James tonight, huh? He would have. He would have had a heyday with that one. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, we're ready to jump in. You want to pull that, that PDF up, Trent? And we ended a little early last week because we wanted to save this to, to talk through, but really it's just a couple of pages, but there's a lot we can get into behind the theory of some of these. Um, and so I'm looking forward to some good, some good discussion on this. Um, so let's just jump right into it here. Apportionment theory. So he says these problems are generally categories as belonging to the apportionment theory or the remnant theory. The first in the absence of monuments is the application of proportion of the total measure distance of a block of lots to the total record distance into the aliquot parts or if proper monuments are found at some lot corners and not others, the measurements between those and that are further apart than one lot width may be prorated against the record. This is used with both straight and curved lines. And so this is a really interesting one. Um, I don't know how much some of our PLSS states get into this um, versus maybe some of our meets and bounds states. But certainly we deal with this quite a bit in Utah because we've got this mix of old pioneer lot and block systems, which, which are, are quite easily applied to this, this method if needed um, because those blocks were created once. Um, you certainly get into some theory with subdivisions or sim simultaneously conveyed lots. Um, but when I really think of this, this apportionment or proration and, and remnant theory, it, you know, my mind goes immediately to these pioneer lot and blocks where the monuments predate statehood and they're, they're all but lost at this point. Hey, did David or uh, John, did you guys go to the mock trial? Because that was kind of the premise of this, right? Okay. 
I don't know if uh, John, did you go? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the the whole mock trial that Carrie Kent had put on at the conference was basically about proportionate measurements and and uh, I didn't catch the whole thing, but uh, that's why I was wondering if John would be able to chime in a little bit. Who did? Yeah, John, you want to walk us through a little bit of of what the situation was in the trial, and we can use that to inform some of our discussion. <laughs> Maybe there you sure. go. Yeah, yeah. sorry, <laughs> um, the. The descriptions, I mean, it was a uh, it was an old subdivision that there were two very large lots. He didn't tell us how much, but just say there was a five acre lot to the north and a five acre lot to the south. And then subsequently, you know, so you had this line, the Evers line that everybody re recognized. And then all the descriptions that were taken out, you know, like 45 feet, 50 feet, 45 foot strips um, for these um, all these summer cottage lots uh, were all in harmony. So there was no overlap or gap that could be perceived, but they weren't, they were all created approximately in 1926. So it wasn't so much that there was a discrepancy with the title and the deeds, but it was more of a discrepancy of where things were laid out on the ground. And it was it was kind of there were monuments on the ground but they weren't the original and it could have been perceived that there was monuments uh there were surveys that were probably done maybe in the um in 26 that related to the cabins the cottages that were um, constructed at that time period there were basically three different surveyors um and there were monuments that were found from those surveys and based upon those monuments that were found, the construction of the homes were basically parallel with those lines. And it was instead of the original, all the descriptions just said east and west, not 90 degrees north, 90 degrees east, not, you know, or north zero east. It was just east and west. So, um, you know, it's, they were in harmony, but to a very wobbly, you know, variation. And, uh, but the houses were all in cock just slightly in relationship to all the found monuments that created these lines, but they weren't the original um, monuments for any map, any uh, track map, subdivision map, but they were perceived to be monuments that probably were created were set in accordance with the deeds at that time when they were laid out. So that was kind of the premise. And then the other, it was up on like a lakefront thing and the, the value of the land was like $20,000 a foot, linear foot frontage. And so, right. and, and it was a discrepancy of about seven foot or something seven, like that between- Seven the, and a half feet. Yeah. yeah. So you're talking, I mean, seven and a half feet, but at $20,000 a foot, you know, it, was, it ended up being a pretty big, Pretty big lawsuit but if anybody ever goes to those conferences um those mock trials are always amazing and so uh yeah i would I suggest if you go to a conference and there's mock trial i definitely suggest going to them so they're amazing yeah and i've then, always loved the discussion that's come out of those afterwards because yep. it, it shows how much we we can agree or disagree um but have civilized discussion too but it's it's so much what your experience brings to those facts or how those facts are presented too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, the unique thing about the trial and what, what's real to true life is, you know, often it's who can argue it best, not what are the actual facts of it. Yeah. Well, and the one thing that was, was interesting and I've been on this end of it is so many times as surveyors, you know, if we're the first surveyor, we just kind of go in and, you know, it's like, oh, you know, this is, pretty easy this won't be that big of a deal and they go in and not thinking that this is going to go to trial and so the first surveyor mm, doesn't do as much due diligence because it doesn't seem to be terrible and the second surveyor coming in probably already knows that there's you know a issue and they do better due diligence and that you know so they're going to be more mindful in this case, it didn't go to trial, but the um, the reason Gary Kent knew so much about it 
is he actually was the second surveyor. Yeah. Oh, good. Coming in with some good experience then. Yeah. Yes, that's good stuff. Okay. Well, thanks for, for sharing that, John, and bringing us up to speed on that, that mock trial there. Um, so we talked about this apportionment theory um, where you're proportioning between, you have a monument here and a monument here, no actual monuments. Uh, again, in Utah, the lot or block system, yet you establish the block and, you know, however many lots are in between there. Uh, just, you know, you, you proportion it equally because they were, in theory, simultaneously conveyed in that case, right, or what was simultaneously conveyed, um, no junior or senior rights in that case. Uh, and the second one is this remnant theory. Uh, the second theory concerns the odd lot, which is usually at one end of a block, although in a rare situation, it may be in some other location because it fills the odd shaped void next to a diagonal or curved street. You know, so think about a, a block or a subdivision, you know, or, or a, a stack of parcels that you've got 50, 50, 50, 50, and 40, or 50, 50, 50, and seven, you know, 60 or something, because it's just the re remnant of that, right? There's not enough to create a, a, a another end lot. So that last one, everything's equal up to a point, and that last one gets everything that's left over. Um, and, and how do we approach that versus, you know, something that they're all equal size, um, sizes? Uh, so in the second paragraph, he says, insofar as writing descriptions is involved with these two theories, the simple reference to the lot shown on the map is still sufficient as far as title for the whole lot is concerned. The problem will arise in case of a partition or a request for a perimeter description of any lot subject to these theories. If you are asked to write a perimeter description, include a tie to each corner of the lot by reference to the map and its recordation for safety and preservation of title. So I just want to throw that out here because normally we just write all of lot one of this subdivision or this lot and block. And, you know, how many times have you guys been asked to rewrite a description um, in a case like this where, where it is a lot and um, you might apply one of these theories and then you've got to write a meets and bounds description of it and it doesn't fit. Any experience with that? They sometimes on ALTAs when you got some issues, right? You have a as surveyed versus, you know, surveyed title title report survey. But Gary can't tell you not to do that, though. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So we've got we've got one where um, one area here where when you go divide a lot in a subdivision, right? A lot of areas will let you put in the description of the subdivision plat all of lot one of this subdivision, and then you know you split that into a new subdivision. You've got lot one and two of the new subdivision. But there are a couple areas here where they actually record they they their their thought process is is that lot one original that gets split when, once it gets split or amended it's vacated, it, it no longer exists. And so you can't use that as a legal description. So you have to do a meets and bounds of it. Um, so that's another time where I've actually had to write a meets and bounds around a lot. Um, but getting into the, the writing of the legal description, how do you guys write that? He's got this, this uh, recommendation of calling out to each of the corners, thence bearing a distance to the Northwest corner of this lot you know, record distance might be this or record bearing might be this. You guys had to do that. Yeah, if it's odd like that with a, with a remnant, then the only way to know that you're going to the corner is to make the call to the corner. Going bearing distance to the to the northeast corner, to whichever corner you're going to, and then and close it out. It's the only way to know that you're, that's where you're going to. I've had to do that before. Mm -hmm. The challenge in, in retracing these, at least that I found, is in theory, this all makes sense. Like this is easy math to me, right? You've got seven, six lots across a, a frontage and they all have equal rights and you measure two feet extra. So you divide that two feet by six lots and you share it equally among everybody. But the interesting thing is when we get into actual survey, then you go out there and you locate the fences and the perimeter and occupation. And then all of a sudden, all of this goes out the window, right? Because 
they're not setting their fence <laughs> with some equal proportionment of all this error that's out there, right? They've done it in all sorts of different ways. So that gets the challenge of theory versus practice, you know, when we're trying to mentor and, and raise new surveyors is this is easy, but the, the application of this might be a little bit more complicated than that. And so it gets into these discussions we're continually having through these Wisdom Wednesdays and Mentoring Mondays is, is you've got to gather all that evidence together in one piece and look at it and and justify why you might not use one of these theories right and use that in your narrative and everything like that okay um that's all on those two pages any other thoughts on the the apportionment or the remnant theory there or your guys's application of that mm -hmm. Okay, um, jumping over to 722, uh, indeterminate calls. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about this over the time. It's, um, but he, I'm just gonna read it here. He's, he does a really good job explaining himself. It is unfortunate that some descriptions require so much time to be wasted in analyzing the meaning of indeterminate calls. Some are easily picked out, such as westerly parallel with the westerly line which is of course impossible. However, when reading along the easterly line of said lot to a point 203.23 feet to a point 12.45 feet from the corner of Jones Land, you wonder what they are attempting to do with no direction given. Also, when you find and running then south to 29.20 east along the easterly line of said lot 16 to 42.58, does this mean 16, 242.58 feet along the easterly line of the lot, or 242.58 feet along the easterly line of lot 16. Mm -hmm. This is a good illustration of the reason why you should not put distances next to a lot or block number. A good rule to follow is to keep the distance immediately next to the direction. In this way, you eliminate the problems in the communication of correct facts. This not only applies to straight lines using a bearing and distance, but also curves using a direction and distance. Let any qualification, qualifications applicable to a line or curve either proceed or follow into the combined direction and distance. Um, I think we ran into this last time we met. I, you know, James and I got into a little bit of a discussion of, of how we were interpreting what Waddles had in, in his example description, right? Um, but we, we do this all the time where we read a description and it doesn't make sense, but we can backtrack it or turn it around and actually kind of make sense of it all and becomes a usable deed in that case. Um, this this idea of, of putting lot numbers next to distances and different things like that, that was definitely kind of new to me. It's never it's not something I've thought about when writing descriptions of how I make sure to separate out those numbers. So it's something I'm going to pay attention to, to more. Um, but I just wanted to point, point that out there. Um, and then the majority probability. This is, I think, probably one of the best paragraphs in any survey book ever. Having reread it again in preparing for this, I think this gets to everything we're trying to accomplish, right? What makes us professionals? And so I'll just, I'm going to do a lot of reading tonight, but I'll read this one too. Majority probability. For correct title interpretation, assemble all the facts, including record and off-record information and occupation as determined by the survey, by survey. From this data, set forth all the probable and possible theories of line and corner positions, giving full consideration to the physical, engineering, title, and legal factors and their interrelationship to ascertain a solution which will fit the majority of the anal analysis most closely. This theory is a majority probability and normally will produce the most satisfactory results. And I, I, that to me, it's just like, this is what we're trying to teach. This is what we're trying to get to is mm -hmm. gather everything, put it all together, analyze it, and whatever fits best is probably what's right. Any, any thoughts on that? It uh, looks like we've got some chat stuff here too. Um, Kyle says, I was under the impression that Brown's 
says that the remnant theory is still being upheld by the courts if a dimension is given on the irregular parcel. And he quotes Brown's 1236 remnant principle. Brown principle 28, where excess or deficiency is given to an irregularly shaped lot at the end of a block, the method is called the remnant rule. Few jurisdictions accept it. Jerry, do you want to unmute yourself and talk through your response there? Yeah. Uh, my comment there was just basically what most of the jurisdictions don't accept the remnant rule, but part of the problem is is whenever you see an, a, an example showing a remnant rule, it's generally a rectangular subdivision, rectangular lots with an oddball at the end. The idea being that everything kind of got pushed off to that side. But when you think about contemporary subdivisions, what constitutes an irregularly shaped lot today? How often do you lay out a grid grid pattern type of subdivision? So most jurisdictions will accept it. And as a matter of fact, most uh, uh, the, the other rule that kind of accompanies that is the undimensioned lot would absorb all the excess or deficiency in a subdivision. And most subdivision regulations today say you have to have dimensions on all of your lots and you have to close to a certain amount and that type of thing. So the, the remnant rule is is that may have been used at one point, but it, it just generally nobody accepts that anymore. I like that. I didn't think of it that way, Jerry, that, you know, when we lay out and design subdivisions, it's, you know, granted, we all did it once like they did then, but you're filling it in to fit zoning and a lot more regulations that maybe even existed back then in some of the older uh, surveys that, that that was applied to, where it was easier just to throw all the leftover excess to one end. You were retracing a subdivision that was laid out in early 1900s would the remnant rule apply potentially because you know let's you've got a rectangular block with a funky shaped parcel at the end it could even have a dimension uh there are surveyors that would say that you know even with that you should put all that um all that excess or uh, deficiency in that last lot well, the remnant rule is just a piece, one piece of the evidence. That's that's just the the map evidence. That doesn't include with the monuments you find on the ground or the lines of occupation. They'll all have to be taken into account together to see if the, where the remnant really is. Jerry just grabbed a book. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking of some court decisions of Wisconsin. It's one of my go-to books in that oh, time. Oh, cool. Yeah. I think, uh, I, as a matter of fact, I think there are decisions in Wisconsin that, that specifically throw out the remnant rule as a consideration. Uh, so, because they look at it strictly as a simultaneous conveyance, and the idea being that because it's simultaneously conveyed, that the, the idea is supposed to be apportioned throughout them. Plus, like Dave was saying there, it, it it's like law, it's a lost corner at that point. You're you're reverting to proportion. You're saying that no other higher evidence exists. So you're, then you're falling back on a, a legal theory as opposed to evaluation of evidence. So it's got to be one of those things where you got to be absolutely certain that no other higher evidence exists, or that the evidence supports a remnant rule approach to it type of thing. So remnant rules kind of an iffy thing to to apply. And we might have some, I mean, we were talking remnant is like the leftover oddball lot, but, you know, I've, I've done a, or seen a couple subdivisions retrace some recently that, you know, the remnant is just the leftover that wasn't developed as well, you know, and so that, that would be a similar terminology, but different application of that, because it's not an oddball at the end, it's not necessarily simul simultaneously conveyed, there is no conveyance and that is just Here's the leftover piece that we're going to deal with at another time. Yeah, it, it, if it never way, gets dealt with, there might be some things to look at there. And the way some some things like that are dealt with, I don't know how universal this is with other states. And that in Wisconsin, we have outlots that is a piece of uh, subdivision that is not developed that doesn't meet code or zoning requirements or whatever, 
it's it's a it's an outlot. It's a piece of land that's kind of left over. It's in a, basically it's a remnant, but that doesn't mean you automatically throw any excess or deficiencies into it. It's just another parcel of land, but in this case, it's not conveyed like a regular parcel because it doesn't meet zoning requirements or development requirements. Unless you want to build an outhouse on, in which case it's an outlaw and you have an outlaw. An outlaw with an outhouse. Thanks, uh, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry, uh, what's the book that you're referencing? You said to Wisconsin kind of <laughs> case law stuff, yeah? This this is a uh, this is a publication that WSLS used to put together. That's just a summary of uh, major court cases uh, pertaining to Wisconsin boundary decisions on uh, highways, navigable waters, and boundaries and that type of thing. Yeah. And it's just a short synopsis of, of primary uh, decisions. It's one I always go to first. For some, we don't do this anymore because nobody goes to the law library to dig up this stuff anymore because uh, everybody does all this crap online and stuff. Now you know you can't get all of it. But it's a really nice little summary document to get major major uh, decision that affect Wisconsin mm -hmm. Uh, per, uh, you know, court decisions and stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Washington just had, uh, Chris Klein just updated uh, Washington State Common Law of Surveys and Property Boundaries, which is uh, similar where it's got some case study type stuff. We were going to have Chris Klein do it for Nevada as well, but um, the price just didn't work out for us on that yeah, one. I, and I don't know how, how in-depth it goes in this. This is mainly just like one or two paragraphs, uh, and it gives a citation so that you can go dig that up and find out the, the additional types of it. It's just mainly the, the main point type of stuff. Yeah. Outside of Brown's books, is there any uh, stuff, David, for California? Is there a case, like case law books for California either? Yeah. Not it's pretty, pretty much knowledge. all around books, but yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. John, do you know of anything? No. Yeah. yeah. It's just funny. I know we we had reached out to Chris, but it came out more money than we than we wanted to spend for him to do that work. And we Nevada doesn't have a lot of case law. Like we don't there's not a lot of cases that no, but no, but it costs a lot to dig through it all. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of research involved with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. In Utah, we just call John Stahl. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we somebody need, a walking book. Somebody needs to get He's, John to write that book, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, kind of, yeah just kind of try to work it into conversation and just record whatever he says. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Well, I like it. So, I mean... At the end, we didn't really come up with a, a clear answer to the, the, the question there, but, you know, I, I think um, kind of su summarize it there is particularly in, in possibly newer type subdivisions or more modern ones is, is we're measuring and mapping those to a, a higher degree of accuracy and completeness. So the, the remnant rule uh, probably does not apply particularly to newer stuff, and there might be situations in older Older ones that it does apply, but you really have to make sure that there's no other evidence that might supersede that 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 would justify just throwing the the excess somewhere. Um, and so, again, it's just all about gathering that evidence and and looking at it as a whole. Um, so, this major probability, I'm probably going to retype that up and get that printed on the poster and put it on our our wall at the office because I think. I think that's a great just summarize summary of what we're trying to do and teach and help people understand is it's all about gathering the evidence. So Jerry's trying to show the book. Is that I do have I do have one more book here that was sent to me from Illinois. It's Illinois Boundary Law by Lucas mm -hmm. uh, that he put together. And it, yeah, it's pretty and I looked in the index just now and there's nothing in there on a remnant rule. So I, I'd have to dig through there's some more to see if there's anything on it, but this is basically a, a you know, the thing we have for Wisconsin, but on steroids. Okay. So there's a guy you want to hire to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all those guys are doing a really great job of doing research state to state when they come in and speak. So, yep. 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 I just threw uh, the link to that one in the chat. Okay. Luke, Lucas's thing. Kyle, does that help? Do you have any other thoughts or questions on that? Uh, I mean, it helps. It, it's, I mean, 
like Jerry says, it it's, comes down to the answer is always, it all depends. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I find it really interesting to compare, you know, Browns, Waddles, and Skelton on this and apportionment. And everybody says something similar, but kind of different. And then everybody additionally um, has 10 different last resorts. And so I always wonder what's the lastest last resort. And in the end, like you say, you know, it's going to come down to what other evidence are you finding and a preponderance of evidence. But it's mm -hmm. um, it's something that I end up doing, you know, trying to find a citation, going to three different books and trying to find the one that actually gives a clear answer. And the way Brown's seventh edition, at least, is written, it's very confident in itself. And, you know, Waddles likes to, you know, say things a little bit where he's hedging it and Brown's is like, this is right, that's wrong. And so it makes it easier to write a test question. It's not necessarily something I always agree with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Well, great. Um, good discussion there. I appreciate that, you guys. Uh, jumping on here to the next couple sections here, the meaning of one half. We've kind of discussed this already in in some of the other chapters of waddles here um but many times owners wish to divide their property in half or buyers oh. wish to buy a certain one half of what the owner has in either case the description must be correctly worded in order to pass title to that which has been requested so um before we go kind of talk about it more but let's just quiz the group here do you guys remember some of the discussion we've had on one half the do's and don'ts are things to consider. And we've got a couple figures out here at the bottom too, so. Anyone wanna jump in with some thoughts? Okay, we'll go to application here. Trent's got it zoomed in for us. So in, in public lands, government rules, a, if, if monuments exist on opposite sides of the section in the area, midway between the outside corners, a straight line is drawn between the found points, wherever they are. See figure 48 here. This may or may not divide the section into two equal areas, but it is in half. Um, if it is a regular section with no existing monuments, then a point is set on the exact midpoint on each opposite side, and a straight line is drawn between them. This may or may not result in two equal areas. So there's there's two ways of determining half. We looked at some irregular trapezoidal shapes in earlier chapters. If, if you jump over to uh, 7.24, um, another great, and I, I know James, if James were here, he'd be going off on this. I'm sad he's not here because we definitely spent some time on, on these, these sections last time we were in them. But uh, point C here, if it is an irregular section, usually called a fractional section, with no existing monuments and the so-called midpoints, then the midway points on the opposite sides will be reestablished by proportion to the original survey and along line drawn between those two points, see figure 50. Um, but, but he's talked about, okay, the, the bottom half is halfway, but that top line is, you know, it's not halfway through there. You could do half and half through there and do some sort of equal area. And so the, the point in all this is what we call half is, is interpretable. And so we've got to be very clear in how we write our descriptions. And just saying the east half or the west half can get tricky because there's, there's different ways of interpreting that. Um, Point two here, in private lands, there are no rules establishing the position of a line between halves if the dividing line is not delineated. If the description east half of lot whatever with no delineation of position of the line between the halves, the position of the line is indeterminate. It might be parallel with one line, right angles to another, or even curved so long as each part has exactly one half of the total area. One man made an arbitrary di division of a, a lot into halves, which made it hold as illustrated in figure 51. So these are halves, but it's not just a straight line half. I, I think if anyone ever does to, were to read a half description, this would be the last place we go with trying to divide it in half. Um, but getting back to that, um, 
majority possibility rule, maybe rule you get out there and you actually measure out the fences or occupation and this might actually make sense then Maybe. Hold, hold, yeah, holding up my book on wisconsin decisions we have a court decision along those lines it says whenever a side of a parent parcel is is uh called for it's presumed that the uh dividing line is going to be run parallel to that side of the parent parcel so by definition it creates a parallelogram offset at you know to create and close half the area so that interpretation is shown there for the private land zone with the zags I, that would not fit this description of wisconsin that would be parallel with that side of, of the parent parcel interesting i know he actually quoted I, i'm not seeing it here i didn't highlight it in my thing but i did note that that he uh wiles actually quoted a, a wisconsin case in this chapter i'm not seeing it right now yeah and i think in brown's book he does say that also the parallel because the idea is that and this is where i always use my 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 family analogy my parent child analogy is the child resembles the parent and that's basically what the court said is when you create a child the child is supposed to be similar in configuration to what the parent looks like so when you call for that side you're creating a parallelogram mm. i've seen if i can find it really quick right here <laughs> yeah I, I i know i saw it as i was scrolling through here earlier today um we'll find it if we haven't already passed it Okay, um, moving on here. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, oh you're good. Let's go back to the citations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Seven point two five, right down there at the uh, in well, right in the middle there. Naturally, the court required a survey, and the survey substantiated the buyer's claim, namely that each side had exactly one half the lot area. In putting up his fence, the buyer wanted to include a tree, so he went part way back then jogged around the tree and then cut back further on the rear of his property of the lot and left more in that area in the back to the cellar on the west part. The court dismissed the case on the grounds that nothing in the deed conveyed nor the escrow stated where the half line should be and the buyer had not preserved any more than his half. Therefore, he was within the law. From this, you can see that it is essential to have the line between halves delineated. Um, and then he gives another example, private ownership of government lands. So if one, one person acquired all the northwest quarter of a fractional section, he could then sell the north half and the south half on an even split of areas, area basis if he wished to as a private owner, or he could sell the parts on the same basis as showing on the township plat. Seems figure 52. This was that held in court case, which said the individual owner, owner of a whole part was free to choose his method of subdivision. So all he's trying to point out here is BLM manuals, GLO manuals, they describe how we split halves of sections, but on the private and Wisconsin being the exception to this, apparently, you know, there are no rules. And I'd be curious to see if there were any other states then that had some rules on what half actually means. Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite things too. Is all these case laws digging into that stuff. I, if I had more time, I would I'd be digging into that stuff. <laughs> that's the one that hasn't the the surveyor in me hasn't burned into getting into case law yet. My my brain starts to hurt when I start reading <laughs> reading the. So I'll leave that to you guys that are are experts in that one or enjoy it more. <laughs> Just. Just to add to that uh, one little thing, I've recently had several record of surveys where uh, that had to be map checked where uh, the legal description called for like the north half and, uh, or the south half. And it wasn't um, the government lands lot, but it was a little more irregular shaped lot. And I insisted that the survey of record put a detailed description you muted yourself, Connie. <laughs> um, there you go. I, I, I insisted that describe which methodology they used in order to determine half because uh, I'm seeing different surveyors use different methodologies at random sometimes. And it's 
a little bit alarming to see that. You know, whether it's by area or they prorate a couple of distances to 50% and just arbitrarily, whether it's parallel to one of the lot lines or it's parallel to the street or, yeah. Mm -hmm. A good narrative is critical, especially in this where there's some ambiguity or some questions to be had, right? You can't be wrong if you told people how you screwed it up. Okay, um, I think that's a good coverage of halves there. He goes on a little bit more and gives some other examples, but I think we've talked about that in the earlier portions of this book. Um, so, so we can go back to those if you wanna learn more or reference those. Uh, 7.27 here, unwritten words. Well, actually before that, the top of the page, again, I'm just gonna reiterate this. He's, he's hit this home really good, but uh, top of 7.27, he says, in the final analysis of descriptions, you must carefully consider all facets of meanings and interpretations before rendering, rendering a description. It's just that's hit true and true every time we've read this, going through this, these chapters here, but he's really kind of making a point. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago too. He's really had some fun with this, with this the last couple of chapters in this chapter here. He's, he's drilling his points in really, really tightly here. Um, so unwritten words, although the courts have held that patrol, parole or and or extrinsic evidence, in other words, evidence alundi, alundi I need to uh, look up that word there. If one, someone wants to look up the word and throw it in the chat there, I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, is admissible to assist in determining the intention of the parties to a document. There are in, instances where the lack of certain words does not detract from the meaning of the description. Um, so right angles, you know, do we do we always say parallel to or perpendicular to, parallel with, perpendicular to, um, tangent? In writing our curves, do we do we always write that you know that's along a tangent curve or a tangent line, um, or is it assumed tangent just even if the line's not there? Connie threw that in the chat there. Connie, what does that word mean? Muted. <laughs> Muted. From another source or elsewhere, uh, it's in not from not ascertainable from uh, a document. Okay. There we go. We've learned we've learned our lesson today. Um, so going back to these these words, you know, tangent. Do we what is right tangent when it's a tangent line or tangent curve? You get to some older descriptions and. You, you rarely see that. I think a lot of the, if you're using a deed writer program, put that in quite often. Um, and, and they definitely put in the, the not tangent part. Um, prolongation, another case in point is relative to parallel lines where the statement is made northerly to a line parallel width and 25 feet southerly from the Eastern prolongation of the northerly line of lot five. This could be written without the easterly prolongation of, and the absence thereof would not defeat the meaning. Um, in doing centerline descriptions, you know, I've gotten the habit, I was trained to do this at the end of a centerline description. The sidelines of said easement are to be shortened or extended or prolonged to as to intersect with the, the boundary on the, you know, north and south sides. Um, the interesting thing about that is I actually just rewrote a, an easement description. It was a, a blanket description that went over an, an entire uh, quarter section. And they wanted us to write a new easement for the portion that we were doing a, a platted subdivision on. And I wrote a center line description. We, it was 50 feet centered on the actual um, gas pipeline, they marked the pipeline, we shot it, and I wrote the centerline description, and the uh, the attorneys for the gas company actually rejected it because they didn't like my shortened or extended language. They forced me to write a meets and bounds completely around the, the description. They wouldn't accept it because it left too much ambiguity in shortened and extended to the property lines. And I argued with them for a second, there is zero ambiguity in there because we are saying that the easement goes to the property lines wherever it is and ends at the property lines. But ultimately I lost that argument in 
in in case of let's just get this recorded and done. <laughs> um, Jerry uh, threw in the chat here, Wisconsin, 1884, where there is a grant of 41 one hundredths. Is that 41 one hundredths of an acre? Adjoining a certain tract of land, the established rule is to run it out in parallel lines in square form to agree with the existing lines and thus make the exact quantity called for in the grant. That's Hartung versus White. A conveyance of a specified quantity of land described as lying on the boundary line of another tract will be construed as conveying a strip parallel to such boundary line and sufficient uniform width to make the exact quantity called for in the grant. That's a parallel lines. So you want to walk through? You have any background on that more, Jerry? Or no, I was just one. I grabbed it uh, at uh, out of the, the decisions book that we have. That's one of the older ones. But that you notice that that is both for an area and also for a distance. But that very first one, if you notice, it's not one side or the other, but it could be like in the corner of a parcel. So like if you're creating the northwest one quarter of a parcel, you would create a as close to a square or equal dimensioned all the way around that creates one quarter of the area that's parallel with the respective sides of the parent. So it covers not just offset line, but offset pairs of lines and multiple lines. What's interesting about that is, again, they have examples of this in Brown, but all that also takes into account curvilinear boundaries. So that your lines do not have to be straight lines. Okay. Let me share that. Concentric circles or um, radial circles or? Concentric circles generally not, uh, not uh, uh, offset circles. It, it basically, if you had like a curved boundary that was a 500 foot radius and you had the east 30 feet, you'd have a circle that was concentric that was uh, 30 foot less radius. The question what it is because, and this is an interesting discussion that they have in Browns, what happens when you reach the extent of the center of curvature of that curve beyond that to intersect the parent parcel? What happens with the continuation of the lines? That's when you start to run into some interesting ambiguities. But that, that's like, you, it's like going back to the remnant parcel is that's your last resort interpretation, providing there's no other evidence, other, other forms of evidence that help you interpret what the original intent was. This gets back to my complaint with some of the original, or not original, some of the older conferences when I went to, we talk about these really, really rare once in a million case, you know, that, that most surveyors won't, you know, have to face in their 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 average career right you know it i got lost in that and kind of you know fell out of focus with surveying during this because like I, i've never had to deal with those and and even today some of those rare cases that we saw of, of this middle of nowhere blm case you know is i just i don't i don't personally deal with those on a on a a, a career basis really never dealt with some of those rare ones, but it's good to have this background. So I appreciate that. Um, going on through his his uh, unwritten words and really talk about written words here, but NAP, on the maps of some subdivisions, one or more areas may be included with the lines of tract, but not established as, as or given numbers as lots in the tract. They are labeled NAP, not a part not a part of the subdivision. For, for one example, this occurs when the seller accepts his home site from the conveyance of a larger parcel to be subdivided in the layout of the new tract with lots set around three sides of the home site and a street in front. All the boundary measurements of the NIP are shown on the tract map, making it eligible for conveyance by direct reference to it in a document. The form of the description to use for the not a part area will be explained in chapter 11. So we'll get there. Um, but this kind of gets even into that remnant. That's where I was saying not a part, but I've seen that as as remnant or leftover piece, um, not a part of the the survey or not a part of the subdivision. 
I don't know that we see that again. We don't see that very often anymore in newer ones. Usually it's just left off, right? Um, at least the ones I see. Do you guys, have you guys ever done a not apart or a remnant tract in the subdivision where you're dividing off most of it, but not all of it? We do, yeah, I would say with us doing like records and surveys within inside commercial subs or something like that, there's always, yeah, we use not apart quite a bit still. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, California Subdivision Map Act has very specific rules on how to use the not a part, how to designate not a part parcel, and which is then different from phased tracts. You could have a tract with a not a part, and then you have some designated remainders that can be tracts that are subdivided under the same tentative map and in different phases. And I've noticed sometimes people can confuse those two concepts. Yeah, I've, I've seen it, you know, future development is another one where you know, you're doing phase one, phase two is coming and it butts against it. And, and I've had a lot of counties push back on that because what if phase two doesn't develop, right? You know, so you don't want to call it future development. So we get back to kind of our base rules of just adjacent owners and, and parcel ID numbers um, sometimes on that. It, um, is that codified in your law or is that just kind of common practice? I think it's common practice, but I'll have to I okay. double check that. I don't can't think of where it's codified um, yeah. in our law right now. Well, so just a, a point of, of information for those who might be studying for California tests. This is actually specified in a subdivision map act on how to uh, how to designate some of these parcels. Okay, thanks, Connie. Um, intention after finding such items in land descriptions is as insufficiency, ambiguity, conflicting elements, mistakes, indeterminate calls, etc. One should not overlook that certain avenue of qualitative analysis that seeks to solve the questionable matters by learning the intent of the parties involved. This is not just a simple matter of asking them because in many instances the originators of the transactions are, are long gone by the time the problems arise to the surface due to its financial value. I, I think a good example of that was uh, the, the mock trial that was brought up, right? That, you know, there's financial value now in that land, uh, to, to, but now the problems are rising where that, that middle surveyor, as it was explained, you know, maybe didn't think it was that big of a deal or was able to solve it, but this new current surveyor brings it up because it's becoming a bigger deal. Um, I don't think I had any of the really notes and intention. We, we talk about this all the time, right? And um, keeping within the bounds of the four corners of the document versus finding what the intention is. Um, let's see. On the top of page 729, he, he writes, it is a general application of the rule that the course and distance give way to, a, to an adjoiner, whether it be marked line as shown on a map and staked on the ground or an unmarked line described in a recorded deed. Um, so that shows intention on how that, that is. Um, a long established adage that the construction of the wording in a description which renders the most certain conclusion is the one to be adopted. Uh, getting back to that, that, that majority uh, principle there. You know. Interpretation of individual including corporate deeds will show favor to the grantor. On the other hand, intent concerning the meaning of a description in a will has been held in favor of the testator because he had, a cert he had certain plans to be carried out. And then the last section in this chapter is construing descriptions. Although the practice of surveying relies in part on the application of mathematical formulas Rules of construction, etc. The professionalism, professionalism of surveying is manifest in the discretionary use of such knowledge coupled with expertise. When a parcel boundary or strip of land is described with sufficient detail and with proper ties, there is no problem. Sometimes, however, in an effort to make sure all the possible ties and references are included, the result is conflict because some of the information is incompatible with other parts. A good description writer will check all references before using them in order to assure compatibility. 
when two descriptions purport to cover the same land, but between which there is repugnancy, the court will review surrounding facts and favor the most definite and those which conform the evident intent. Certainly, where one is ambig ambiguous, the other more certain will prevail. If reference is made to a map which is inconsistent with other particulars, the map will be given preference to the parties to the transaction accepted the map as their common understanding. Otherwise, that map is considered as subordinate to ascertainable and definite facts. Um, what a great conclusion to a lot of great discussion and review of, of writing legal descriptions. Um, That's, I, I mean, I've said it 15 times already today, but what a, what a great analysis of what our job and role is as, as surveyors is, is reviewing all the facts, finding which best fit the evidence there, um, and going through and, and reviewing our work as we write descriptions. You know, we can become blind to our own descriptions sometimes. So having an independent party, you know, uh, an LSIT or a drafter just quickly punch those in, make sure it makes sense since we've been staring at them and we've become tied to those, you know, because they're ours, but going back through and, and really making some of those checks help us avoid some of these mistakes and some of these, these ambiguities or inconsistencies in our own descriptions. Any thoughts from, from the group here on, on his kind of conclusion? And, and how we do our job in, in analyzing descriptions and interpreting them. Well, I still say this is one of Waddle's favorite chapters. He's put more mm -hmm. emphasis and emotion in this chapter more than anything else. You can tell he really, he really likes that. And it, it shows in everything that he's put on there how relevant it is, it is to the work that, that we do. Absolutely. I, I want to hear uh, Jeffrey Lucas read that last, that the construing descriptions portion. I can I can I can feel Waddle's enthous enthusiasm in it. I'd love to see uh, uh, Jeffrey Jeff Lucas's, you know, his preacher uh, reading that one out would be would be great. I, I love it. I, I really did enjoy this chapter um, for those same reasons you brought up, David. It, you you see his passion is surveying, you see what we're trying to accomplish. And it fills in the gaps. It gives surveyors permission to make decisions, to get in there and break things down, which too often we're afraid to because we're always told that we're not supposed to. But this very clearly tells us how we can do that. Okay, I will throw it out to the group. Do we, we've got, we really have a half hour left of what we normally meet. Do we want to get into chapter eight or do we want to push that off for a couple of weeks? Let's see, how long, how long does it go? Eight's got 11 sections. It's not a huge one. Oh, it's, yeah, 16 sections, yeah. Oh, 16 there, yeah. yeah. I got to take off my rides here. <laughs> Carpool with the wife, so love it, love it. I like it. Well, I'm good to wait. I'm not necessarily prepared to go through this in detail. If you guys are okay with that, I, yep. I got a question on the email I got today for the uh, Wisdom Wednesday's notification. It had sessions listed for the next couple of consecutive weeks. Is this supposed to be still every other week, or are we going every yeah. week for a while now? No, we were supposed to. Be, I think I just got off on the schedule, so I just probably got to update. Oh. Uh, okay, so we are. Oh, I, I think, yeah, so on the website, I have the 10th. Yeah, I think I just got to go in and delete some of those meetings, but okay, I'll do that. I didn't want to do it like leading into the meeting because sometimes it'd be like, oh, tonight's canceled. So I do it in okay. between, but I have April 10th as our next one. Um, oh. And that was supposed to be chapter 10, but <laughs> we're a couple chapters behind already. We're servers. We're supposed to be behind. I know. I was going to say <laughs> at some point, because like right now it was going to end May 22nd. But I mean, I guess if we run into maybe the first week of June, but I think if we go too deep into June and we'll start losing everybody. So, well, yeah. well, it is a leap year. So we do have time to get caught. <laughs> we had a couple extra hours. Um, can I ask you a quick question? 
it, it's it. summer. Yep. I um so um it, 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 this is kind of just a, a, a random, but <clears throat> at y'all's like respective shops, um, is it the art? Well, I'm in Texas, the RPLS like that is typically writing the legals, or is it the text and then and then the the surveyors? Because I I heard the mention of you know the cross you know making sure that it's double checked and i think there's kind of a debate here amongst um amongst like some of our peers on who who's writing them and then who's checking them like i just wanted to get y'all's opinion on or you know your feedback on how you guys operate i was gonna say so from my aspect i'm fortunate where i've i have eight other ls's in the office and the other seven are project managers basically so they're the ones writing uh, and then I'm, then we have another LS back check it. And then I'm the last. So we technically, we have three back checks. Okay. They, an LS writes it, another LS back checks it. And then I, I even have the, the younger staff read them before we let anybody else do it to see if they find anything and just for them to be able to learn it. And then another LS and then I'm actually the last, I'm the last one to read it, but cause I'm the one that's final stamping it. And so from an ethics standpoint, staying on responsible charge, right? So um, I, I, I make sure I check everything that goes out of my door. But. That might be, I had a guy from Texas that, that worked for me for a little bit and, and I do it a little bit differently. I, I have some of my drafters write some of the ones that I trust them to do, right? Um, or if we're making adjustments to subdivision plat, we've changed some lines. I give them the freedom to go and make those adjustments so I can work with them and teach them and train them. But like Trent, ultimately I'm repunching those and, and, and going through it. But the guy that I had working for me from Texas was pretty surprised because it, where he was came from, like that was the RLS was it. He was the only one writing them and doing them. And, and, and I use that both as a training tool, but as a project management tool, because if I was writing every single one of them, I'd, I would never get a description out some some weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have them prep it, write it, and then I'll go through and proofread it. And usually what I'm adding is the qualitative language that's in there, calls to adjoiners, calls to other deeds that they're just not comfortable or um, used to, to pulling into it. I yeah. just take it straight from Carlson. <laughs> no no way absolutely not no i'm just kidding don't do that <laughs> or i was gonna say legal aid right legal aid letter legal aid, no, yeah. Stamp it. yeah no I, I there's lots of i would say it depends on the firm right but i mean like I say ultimately is you as the ls you're gonna you're gonna review it but as kyle put in there sometimes it's the text and then um reviewed by ls's so no and, yeah. and i'm just gonna throw in um responsible charge but also mentoring is the reason i have my text do descriptions because eventually they're going to be expected to do this yep. and unless they have practice they're never going to really learn the ins and outs and the nuances but ultimately yeah just like trent or trent either of the trends were saying yep. I'll, I'll ultimately be the one signing it and i'm ultimately the one that's signing off on it um so so i'm the last review before it goes out the door every time yeah. yeah. So, so yep. Jerry threw out there some of the worst descriptions he's encountered <laughs> have been written by surveyors. Yeah. And Kyle threw out there made a made a part here too was a good mistake that he saw come from it. Um, and then Teresa says written by survey staff and then the QAQC by the ALS. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, I think ultimately, right? It's, yeah. yeah. A couple of workshops I've done on on writing and interpreting legal descriptions. When I talk with surveyors, they're not even familiar, well, not familiar with, but don't understand the implications of the rules of construction and the appropriate way to interpret them and that. If you can't understand the rules of construction, you can't write a, a, a competent description because you're not going to write it in a fashion that somebody else is going to be able to interpret it correctly later on. So it, it's you have to know how to interpret them in order to know how to write them. It's a vicious circle type of thing. And, and I don't think you can ever get trained enough on that. And it's like any writing exercise. The only way you get better at it is to keep working at it 
in getting constructive feedback from someone mm-hmm. knows what it's about. And that's why, like, with, with Trent's process of, hey, you go through a couple of iterations and have one person signing off on it at the top that's familiar with the, the concepts is a good way for someone to learn how to do the process as opposed to just saying, well, let's pull out and see what's in these other descriptions we've encountered and that, and then write on that. Because because the worst ones I see the survey that when they start writing like attorneys, mm. and they start using <laughs> phrases like a set, a four set, heretofore, and all that kind of crap like that. <laughs> they don't normally talk like that. And that's when they run into problems because they don't understand that the reason attorneys use specific words is they each mean something legally. Mm-hmm. And once you put that into a description, that's the intent that goes forward from that day. I'll, I'll add to what Jerry's saying. I, I When we were doing some legislative stuff, they, they talked about what a surveyor may do this, a sur- surveyor shall do this, a surveyor will do this, sh- may, will, shall have very distinct meanings in legal ease. Um, so there's that. The other thing I'll throw out there again, uh, with the mentoring is, it's not just that we're correcting and writing, you know, I'll go back and sit with my staff and talk them through what I changed, why I changed and how I wrote it. So, so they, they grow, right? If I can just, if I have them write it and they pass it to me and I change it, I don't tell them what I changed or why I changed it. They don't grow and they don't learn anything. So there's, there's definitely that shant, shant. I was going to say, so the the biggest changes in the 21 ALTA standards was the um, shall and must, right? Because shall is interpretive. It doesn't say, it's not, it's not definitive, right? It just says, uh, and that's why they re re change the words to must, must do this, must do that, um, Mm -hmm. as opposed to shall, because it, it wasn't as strong a meaning. And that was, that was through court case, um, wording as well that's why they changed all that and then um, back to jerry's um, conversation rules of construction on mentoring mondays is week 87 and then we also just a few weeks later we had writing and interpreting legal descriptions in week 96 Um, so there's a couple of those that we could go back to and uh, ron ron nelms had done the writing and uh writing and interpreting legal descriptions i know we've had quite a few uh different writing legal description ones, but those are always fun. So different perspectives from different people too. I like it. So Jerry's thrown Wilst Endeavor, Kyle threw in, thence back from whence you came. Summer, I think that was a great question. I appreciate yeah. you throwing that out there. That that uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> that was uh, for some great conversation there. So yeah. thank you. Uh, no, thank you guys. Thank you very much. People need to look up what the word thence means. Not everybody knows what dense means. Mm-hmm. There's a specific meaning to the word. The difference between then and dense is really interesting. And I think it'd be interesting to hear Jerry's take on it because it is kind of like a legalese thing um, that surveyors use, but you know, it, it means a specific thing that, yeah, I don't know. the difference between then and dense is a fun trivia question for mm-hmm. surveyors, I guess. So I just Googled the difference between then and that. So the first thing that came up is to write plainly use then instead of the archaic term thence. But what I like, and I think what you're getting to is, is the meaning it for, for thence is from that place, right? Which, which really gives it a, a locational definition to me, right? We've yeah. gone to a point, bearing a distance to a point, thence, from that place, the the unwritten thing, you know, we can write a description that's from that place to the next one, but it's implied in there. I like that. That was really, thank you for yeah. pointing that out. It says the import is that the following course is continuous uh, with the one before it, as in it's, they're supposed to be connecting and there's, uh, yeah, ba- basically the, the continuity from that point on so these courses are not arbitrary uh, yeah Kyle threw in there further and farther uh there was a um, 
radio commercial for a challenger elementary school here and uh they used that further and farther in it that moms were having a conversation and the little daughter you could in the radio commercial the daughter would step in and say you should be using further and you know and just <laughs> go under this whole thing at like a little eight-year-old or something and they're like how do you know that uh, i go to the challenger elementary school or something like that and so it's this uh private school but it's funny that he pulled that up because that was their radio commercial was the difference between further and farther <laughs> that's pretty funny i like it I did have uh, one more from the conference and we had the conversations this morning at the office, um, not related to legal description, but maybe uh, our California friends might have some input on this, but Gary, uh, Gary Kent said there's only two states that don't have uh, like a standard of care or horizontal uh, uh, tolerances and, and in, as part of their state codes. And it's California and New York. So there's no horizontal uh, positional certainties in California. And so we looked it up and I, I was like, there's no way. And I, I, you don't even really think about it. You just, you survey to your normal standards, right? But like Nevada, we have horizontal and vertical accuracy standards that we're supposed to adhere to for boundary surveys and rural surveys and all these different things, right? So we, we looked it up and the only thing I could find is in the PLS Act and it says, after making a field survey in conformity with the practice of land survey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's wide it's open. It's vague. Yes. It was, so it's very vague. I, I, I sent that question to, uh, to Rick in Dallas this morning. I'm like, mm -hmm. what is the meaning of conformity with the practice of land survey? Like, they, they, is, uh, initially, the backstory to that is that California, since it's such a large state, and this was explained to me by the Cuomo's way back, yeah. that California was such a large and diverse state with so many different practices and so many different land uses and types mm -hmm. that uh, they, they didn't want to restrict surveyors at the time with trying to dictate very specific standards to everybody. They wanted to leave it up to the professional to decide what is appropriate for their local practice and what is appropriate for their um, the type of the survey. However, this is no longer serving us very well. And it actually something that I just started doing at the beginning of this year is I'm writing a proposal to first define accuracy standards for the state and uh, probably get them uh, passed into the PRC code uh, for the moment without demanding that certain things be done at a different accuracy, but just to allow us to define accuracies. And yeah. then as a second legislative pass, we can then start examining how to put this into the law that a little more narrowly defines what type of accuracies are uh, appropriate for different uses. And this will start with very high-end first-order networks all the way down to GIS work. I want to yeah. cover everything because that also will give us potentially a mechanism to oversee uh, GIS work even at very low uh, precision levels, you know, and th and that hopefully will compel surveyors to take a little more interest in in GIS work because eventually they will be the ones who will have to attest to the accuracy of certain GIS work because they will be the only ones qualified to do that. Yeah, is that the stuff you got? Is Wooly Wooly talked about it? Couple of years uh, yeah, Willie and I have been tossed to, uh, yeah. talked about it. He's he had a little different proposal where he wanted to impose accuracy standards immediately on everybody and kind of create uh, almost a one size fits all condition, and that that died in a process. And it wasn't there was no specific proposal written. He was just kind of talk, uh, tossing it around. But right now I'm at the Orange County at my chapter level. I just forming a ta task force that will actually go examining exa existing accuracy standards from different states and from different agencies that already practice in California, kind of sort it all out, try to make sense, uh, some kind of logical sense out of it, and then make a formal written proposal that's going to be presented to CLSA legislative committee to start considering yeah. Uh, uh, that and putting it into legislation so that's going to be a bit of a process but that's like 
<laughs> my personal mission this year. <laughs> there you go. Trent Keenan, how long has Nevada had accuracy standards? Yeah, I, I'm, I was going to go look and see if I could look it up, but I know our our code, believe it or not, is it's an NAC code, 625666. That's our horizontal. That's <laughs> so weird, that's the number. But uh, yeah, no, it's, I'm, I'm curious to see, uh, I don't know how long it really, I mean, as long, obviously, as long as this is my 20th year as a license surveyor, and it's, it's been around as long as I can ever remember, but let's see if it uh, has any kind of um, back date on it. So yeah, it's. Maybe while you're looking at that, Jeremiah, I'm trying to remember where it is in Utah code. If we if we have actually in the state code, I know it's in our UCLS standards, but you could probably quote it faster than I could. What where Utah's standards are for accuracy? Looks like uh, November of ninety seven. If I look up the codes, and it's they're all pretty much saying stating by the, uh, and I added to the NAC board by professional engineers and surveyors effective eleven fourteen of ninety seven. So. Okay. So fairly recently then. Yeah, recent enough anyway. But mm -hmm. yeah. Crazy. Jeremiah must have stepped up. <laughs> he must have. I was trying to remember the the yeah. I, I pulled up real fast on our UCLS website. We don't actually reference back to state code. I'm trying to remember where it is. Because I know the subdivision acts and I know the our licensing act, but I wasn't seeing it in there. So I'll have to look for that and remind myself where it is. Yeah, just something you don't even, uh, Gary's the one, when he was in his ALTA presentation, he was talking about it as far as, uh, you know, and so in that instance, like have you just, the standard standard of care of a prudent land surveyor in the area, like it's like, you know, how does this so, so vague. So I just thought it was weird, but. I, I, have, a, I have a question. Going back to, uh, sorry to derail the discussion about no. accuracy. Go for it. Go, go back, if you could go back to that original slide, the description that had the basis of bearing. Yeah, let was, me share that. One of your first ones. That was, that was mine. Yeah, that was your first slide you shared, yeah. This one here? Yeah, yep, that one. So, and I've been thinking about this <laughs> throughout this whole discussion. <laughs> so, so was was that basis of bearing really the state plane grid bearing? But whoever wrote the description is saying, "Here's how you can check that." Now, the check is from a witness to a corner and to a calculated point, which are two things that, you know, the witness corner, maybe that is still there and the calculated point is theoretical. But was that what they were trying to say is the, the basis is state plane grid, but here's how you can check. That. And that's the way I would, if I were, I don't work necessarily in state plane grid, particularly in this area. Um, because they, they have a kind of a, a bastardized uh, system uh, pre-83 that's just county specific. But uh, um, if I were to do just turn on the GPS, turn on state plane NAT 83, you know, yeah, that's what I would call my basis of bearings is, is cores VRS derived bearing, you know, and this is my setup for it because then that's reproducible. Um, uh, just five, six minutes. So you're right. That that really is his basis of bearing is the NAT 83 state plane VRS derived, you know, or something to that effect. The, the, well, technically, the basis of bearing would be the grid system, the state plane grid. Yeah. What what where we're, we're getting at, and, and what most most laws have, most states have for a law is how can you recreate that on the ground or determine what the surveyor was using as the grid system on the ground. That's why it's important to be, like in most PLS states, it generally refers to a line in the original public land survey system, you know, between original corners and that type of, that's what we use in Wisconsin. So, I mean, at that point, then it can be a county grid, it can be a state plan grid, or it could be an assumed bearing for all that matters, as long as it can be recreated on the ground. That's the important aspect of it. And this can't be 
Because I, oh, I oh, can't yeah. accurately determine what his calculation of an intersection is. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like they, they tried to give the basis a bearing. They just kind of missed the mark a little bit on the line to recreate it. Yeah. The funny thing is all the section corners are in right here. So that... For me, there's really no excuse, but yeah, why why would you pick those two things other than nobody's gonna be able to prove you wrong? I think maybe I that was the one attempt. Would, one would hope that there is more context on a map where this actual uh calculated intersection can then be recovered, that the cal can be followed from other found monuments. However, as written the the in a narrative here, you don't have enough information. Yeah, I strictly, yeah. No, I'm, go ahead. I'm sorry. So there's, oh, yeah. so there's no corner set and there's no additional information that helps on the face of the map. I, yeah, I strongly yeah. Said, I suspect that in this particular case, because he's dealing with the calculated corner and the witness corner, that was never an occupied line, but it was a, strictly a computed bearing along that line. Oh. Coordinates at one end and coordinates at another end. And from that done, inversing between them, Established what his basis of bearing was, his grid direction. Yeah, I'm going to pull up the, I won't share it here, but I'm actually going to pull up the rig <clears throat> survey here. Because he says he does call the witness corner found on the map. Does he have more than one monument found on that map? Yeah, <laughs> no, where's, where's, your, where's your two found monuments? Come on. There yeah. are no two found monuments. And to make things worse, there is no actual tie from his basis of bearings or monument line to the property. So the property itself still floats. Oh, geez. <laughs> but he does show gaps and overlaps of a fence. So, you know. And yeah. they're proven, huh? Proven. And how, <laughs> how old is this survey? Um, less than two months old. Oh, shit. Wow. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wow. So, so the channel Dave Woolley, are you going to make a, a report? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say. Out there quick, it still might be painted on the pavement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, this oh is my gosh. Of, the, the company that did this uh, doesn't do civil, and uh, this is turning into a lot split that needs some civil work, so that's why I, it landed in my lap. And I had a survey done. Can you use this to to lessen the price and get the civil work done, and no, that means it costs double now. <laughs> yeah, it go up. Just, just remember, you young surveyors, all you guys caught up in technology now. It's becoming easier and easier to do crap like this. But pretty soon, you don't have surveyors involved in the process at all in creating these problems in the first place because the technology is, allows them to do that. Mm -hmm. I may be the youngest person on the call, but I know better than that. Mm -hmm. I can still set up a total station, get my triple prism out, and backside a, a section <laughs> quarter mile, half mile away. And but no engineering firm in their right mind is going to hire a person like you because it costs too much. <laughs> they can replace you with technology. Hell, they've even got a, a mechanical dog that they can replace you with now. You know, it's got built-in GPS and stuff. You know. Don't give my boss he, an idea. He, he, can may just whiz, do that. he can whiz a lot more accurately than you can. Jerry, <laughs> you're making me depressed here. Summer again. <laughs> That's, this is why it took me three times to retire. <laughs> <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of money in survey litigation a few yeah. years down yeah. the road. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially with that stuff. Uh huh. You know, I got to tell y'all, this week alone, I think we've gotten requests from our own council or referrals from council and uh maybe five uh cases and i'm just like what in the world is going on here and it's just it's it's janky uh legals <laughs> um it really it, it's just it's it's just sloppy work uh uh the there's discrepancies and the subtlety in it, it throws everything into into legal you know it's just um and that's why i appreciate what y'all were saying earlier about this you got to go through it with a fine tooth comb and and have and have, triple check it you know um it, it's just remarkable how how a single oversight or fat finger or whatever and it just throws everything into mayhem um and uh but you know 
I guess that's why we we gotta do what we do as well as we as yeah. we do. <laughs> exactly. Technology is not always our friend. Nope. nope. Mm -mm. Kyle, did you get a good question written tonight out of this? <laughs> yeah, I'm like. 75% of the way done. Well, I accidentally send it at 10 30 p.m. tonight. <laughs> Love it. When I finish it, but uh, yeah, it's going to be on halves. Uh, I love it. Heck yeah. That's awesome. I've gotten out of the habit of doing the quizzes, but I look at them every day. I got a little bit behind on it, and then I just don't do it. But I need to get back in the habit because I did appreciate that, Kyle. So yeah, exactly. I'll respond tomorrow. There you go. You should have said back in the habit. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome great conversations as always i love it um april 10th you good for april that 10th. okay and thanks then, guys uh, have a great night mentoring on this monday is uh jacob Heck. so and he is doing uh datums and reference frames the past present and future of nsrs so that'll be a great one yep Thanks. All right, guys. Bye. All right. Have a good night. Bye, guys. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye.